Niels Bohr himself mm -hmm. noticed the analogies between uh, thought and quantum phenomena. And then uh, uh, David Bohm, in a book that he uh, wrote about 1950 when he was teaching quantum physics at Princeton, also has uh, several uh, paragraphs pointing out the analogies between thought processes and quantum phenomena. Wh and, and what are those analogies? Well, the analogies are that um, in quantum theory, you have that the world seems to divide naturally into thought-like things and rock-like things, or sort of thought-like matter and, and, and non-matter. Uh, now, I have to uh, say at the outset that I'm going to be giving the picture of the quantum reality according to uh, David Bohm's uh, view of things. Which is uh, in the same tradition as Einstein. Which is the same tradition as Einstein. There are two, there's like a schism now in physics today between uh, Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein. Uh, Niels Bohr and Einstein debated the meaning of quantum theory, and they were never able to uh, come into any agreement. Uh, the controversy still rages on today. And, and it has to do with Einstein's famous quote that God does not play dice with the universe. Exactly. Uh, Einstein did not believe, well, let's put it this way. Uh, Bohr said uh, that God does play dice with the universe, but that he uses a uh, fair, fair uh, coin, mm -hmm. so to speak. It's 50 50. Um, what is beginning to uh, become clearer and clearer, <laughs> at least from my point of view, is that to the extent that God does play dice with the universe, he loads the dice. He plays with unfair dice, and the loading of the dice is our consciousness. That's where consciousness comes in. So, Back, back to the or original uh, question, the analogy between uh, what you sometimes call uh, the, the uh, level two or the quantum mechanical level and, and the and thought. Okay. And thought. It, it's okay. uh, the, the, here's the way I, this is the universe according to Jack, the okay. world according to Jack. Uh, reality, physical reality has three levels. Mm -hmm. I'll call it level <laughs> one, level two, mm -hmm. and level three. Okay. Uh, level one is the level of what's called classical physics. Yeah. It's the ordinary physics of automobiles and, and you know, spacecraft and uh, uh, things like that. Um, and uh, uh, if you want to use David Bohm's language, it's what David called the explicate order, mm -hmm. the outer order of things. Right. It's uh, space and time and matter as we normally perceive it. Okay. That's level one, classical physics. Beneath level one is level two, which is the quantum reality. Okay, in quantum reality, what's happening is that these thought-like patterns of information are guiding the behavior of the level one material. Now, these thought-like patterns of information, they are still physical fields, mm -hmm. but they are fields that exist beyond ordinary space and time but they influence, they project into mm. space and time, they influence they, space they and time. They exist in hyperspace. They exist, you could call it, they exist in a hyperspace, which is almost like a cyberspace, if you like. Yeah. It's almost like, uh, like the, the space of, it's like a mind space in a way. I mean, that alone, is, to my way of thinking, is such an extraordinary realization. The, the physicists are saying this higher dimensional hyperspace is as real as, uh, as, as anything else. It, it, in fact, it's not Although only it's it's real, material. It's non-material, but it's physically real. In fact, without this thought-like space of information beneath the surface of things, uh, matter would not be hard. You have to, the hardness of matter, the stability and diversity of matter depend upon these thought-like patterns that are beyond space and time, but which actually mm -hmm. influence the structure of uh, matter in space and, and time. And you make an interesting distinction that these thought-like patterns, these quantum fields, I suppose we could call them technically the Schrodinger waves of yes. quantum mechanics, yes. the psi waves, psi in, waves in, yes. incidentally, uh, but they're not conscious. No, they're not conscious yet. They're not conscious at level two. Now, a level two is also called by Bohm the implicate order. Mm -hmm. Some of you may have heard of that the universe, like a hologram, the holographic universe, things like that. That sort of has to do with the, the, the implicate order. Mm -hmm. But um, although the quantum properties of matter are thought-like, they're still not conscious the way we're conscious. They're not self-aware yet. But I'm still a little unclear. Why are they thought-like? Sim simply because they're non-material? Well, that's part of it. They're thought-like for several reasons. Um, they're thought-like because, number one, they're beyond space and time. They're non-mechanistic, 
Mm -hmm. which means although they influence matter, they don't influence it in a kind of mechanical push and pull force kind of way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I call it the force without force. Uh, you could think of it, it's almost like a telepathic influence. It's, if you want to think of it mm -hmm. in a popular way, it's uh, the force of Star Wars. Remember the force, Luke. It's that sort and of a thing. more like uh, probabilities. And well, I don't even want to say probabilities. A lot of quantum physicists talk in terms of probabilities, but the important thing to realize about Bohm's way of looking at the quantum world is that probability is a secondary thing. It's not fundamental. Yeah. Okay. That Bohm's theory really deals with the weird properties of, of individual systems, and probability comes out a little okay. bit later. It's, it's mm -hmm. a more of a superficial aspect yeah. to, to, to the world. That's mm -hmm. why, see, Bohm was working with Einstein, and that's, you know, according to Bohm, God really doesn't play dice with the universe. Dice is probability, throwing dice is mm -hmm. probability. So it's not quite, so although probability plays a role, it's not a fundamental role in terms of understanding the way the mind works. And now you've introduced what you call level three. That really goes beyond what yes. most physicists talk about today. Even Bohm just barely alluded to yeah, it. Yeah, Bohm just barely alluded to it. Level three, that's where the mind is. Mm -hmm. That's where consciousness is, uh, at least my opinion, my humble opinion. As right. they say on the internet, <laughs> I, what is it? I, in my, I M H O, in my oh. humble opinion. Okay. <laughs> That's the acronym. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and this is the big uh, debate now. The really new thing in physics is whether level three exists. Now, uh, I say it does exist. Bohm referred to it as the super implicate order. So you have level one is the explicate order, the outer order. Level two of ordinary quantum reality is the implicate order. You could say the inner order. And level three is something even deeper. With, let's call it the super implicate order, and that's where mind is. In fact, even the mind of God, that's mm -hmm. the mind of God. And, and so you, if I understand you correctly, resolve the classic mind-body problem of philosophy by suggesting that mind was sort of there from the very beginning at level three. Absolutely. Level three is the deepest level of all, mm -hmm. of all reality. And you can say that level one and level two are sort of like, you know, they just emerge out of the, uh, the sentient level three. So it really is... Uh, a conscious universe at the deepest level, or a sentient universe, which gets us also, you know, Dean Radin's book yeah. on paranormal, uh, it's called uh, The Conscious Universe. And I guess I'll give him a plug. <laughs> 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 that is the mm -hmm. picture. So what, what you're saying is consistent, in effect, with the uh, classical views of mystics of almost all cultures, and that is that this, this reality of space and time and matter and objects and, and bodies sort of evolved from a, a, a superconscious realm. Absolutely, yes, that, that's the truth. But I, I like to call it mysticism without mysticism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because there really is a technology inherent in this, and it's not uh, just vague po poetry. You know, it's real physics that's going to have implications for our lives. And, and some of the implications uh, for you, I know that you're very interested in, are, are the possibility of using these models to design and build Conscious computer chips. Absolutely, conscious computer chips. Um, and that would be an application of uh, what's called nanotechnology. Uh, a nanometer is like a billionth of a meter. It's uh, at the level of a couple of uh, atoms uh, wide. And uh, uh, we have reason to think from a, uh, uh, a theory, well, not, I guess observations of a man named Stuart Hameroff, who's an anesthesiologist at the uh, University of Arizona, discovered that inside the nerve cells are what's called these microtubule structures, and they are nanotechnology level structures. And uh, there are these uh, little electrons inside the uh, microtubules, and the electrons control the shapes of protein molecules. The, the, the protein molecule could be like closed fist or open switch. It's like a switch. It's like a, little quad, it's like a switch like on a computer, just like a transistor on a computer. And it looks as though when we, when we actually look at the subneuronal level of our nerve cells, it looks like a computing circuit uh, at the microtubule level. Mm -hmm. So the idea of the, of the uh, chip, of the, uh, the conscious computing chip, will be to use nanotechnology to simulate what's actually in our nerve cells. And then if the theory is right, if there's this level three mm -hmm. post-quantum physics, I call it, if that theory is correct, we should make an artificially uh, conscious um, computing device sort of like uh, Commander Data's brain in Star Trek. That's exactly, we're talking about conscious mm -hmm. robots, conscious androids. They will be as conscious as humans. Mm -hmm.